Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My, my name is Bert Tussing. I'm the Director for Homeland Defense and Security Issues here at the Army War College. I work in the Center for Strategic Leadership, which as my students will tell you is, that means I teach a little bit, I write a little bit, but mostly what we do at CSL is outreach work. And so for me, that means I do a significant amount of outreach work with the Department of Homeland Security, the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense, the National Guard and the National Guard Bureau and my, my, my guard friends will, will reinforce the notion that that can be wildly different things from time to time. Uh, the United States Northern Command, our North, things like that. People who are, who are genuinely dedicated to, uh, to these issues. Uh, I will tell you, I was, I was just explaining to the gentleman up front here, I, I've never had a job. Um, I did uh, just under 25 years in the United States Marine Corps. I uh, never felt bad about a moment of what I was doing not particularly tickled from time to time on what, what was happening, where I was doing it at the time, but pretty happy about that. And then through an incredible set of circumstances, I stumbled into this job, and I've been here for the last 22 years. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, I've been on the public dole now for 47 years. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all taking care of me. I wanted to talk with you all a little bit uh, today about uh, the Army's role in, in something that we think of as, as out of the norm, but we need to be thinking about it. Uh, quite seriously all the time. It's, it's domestic imperative. Now when we talk about the Army's mission, when we talk about the military's mission writ large uh, within our country, we usually talk in terms of homeland defense, which is something that we are leaning forward to prepare for, but fortunately we have not had to demonstrate in some time so far. Thank you, Lord. And uh, def what we refer to as defense support of civil authorities, where we, we bring in those, those incredible capabilities uh, the, the, the most important of which is those wonderful young men and women who will respond to crises at the time of requirements. But that's what we do. That's how we look at it. But whenever I have an opportunity to talk to a group like you, I, I like to start by, by telling people that Homeland Security is not a governmental function. Okay? It's more of what we think of as an enterprise. Okay? And there is a governmental function in that, to be sure. The federal government, of course, should be providing for the framework of everything else that happens around. But when it talks about when you talk about government and these issues, more than anything else, folks, I would I would recommend to you that the application, the implementation of that framework doesn't occur within the Beltway, it occurs in state, local, tribal, territorial governance all around the nation. That's where the rubber meets the road. But if we think that uh, that's where it stops, then we really need to realign our thinking about that because you know, we talk about critical infrastructure in the United States. Basically, those, those uh, systems or components of the systems which are so vital to our people that if they are disrupted or, or destroyed or interrupted or something like that, it will lead to a, and I love this, this terminology, governmentees, a debilitating impact upon our country. What does that mean? Well, it means it could start a series of cataclysmic cascading events that could bring the country to its knees. Now, when you think about something like that, and, and you pass a, a definition like that, that out to my favorite citizen, who my students will tell you, my favorite citizen, Joe Sixpack. Okay, Joe Sixpack, when you talk to Joe about this kind of stuff, Joe says, well, you know what? If this is that important, then the government must really have this baby by the throat, right? I mean, they must have tight, tight, tight control of this, right, right, right? And the answer to that is, eh, not so much. Because when we think about critical infrastructure in these United States, 85 to 95 percent of it is owned by the private sector. People don't think about that. And therefore, it's probably pretty incumbent upon us all to incorporate the private sector into our thinking, into our plans, into our strategies about the security of that critical infrastructure. But there are things beyond that as well. Non-governmental organizations. Now, there are a few, and I won't point it out, point you out specifically, but there are a few people in the room who are almost as old as I am. And you remember back at, at one time when we were talking about homeland security and when we, were, when we were talking about issues regarding to responding to emergencies, there, there was a, a, a construct uh, of, of responsibility. And those responsibilities uh, stretched everything, everywhere from from transportation to communication to mass casualties and things like that. You know, until about the middle of the last century, the entity that was charged with responsibility for mass casualties in the United States, the American Red Cross. And that type of entity still exists, and those types of organizations still exist. 
And we would therefore be very well served to incorporate their thinking, their expertise, their background, and their resources into trying to bring all of this together. So that's kind of important to us as well. But we need to th be thinking beyond that to this area of international partners. Now, I have to tell you that I am so happy that I have at least one student in here who is not from the United States. There you are. Very glad to see you. What? We in the United States, I never, ever, ever apologize for our country. What we do, where we do it, how we do it. We are, we are far from perfect. But I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that in the history of the world, if there is, if there is an, a more benevolent society than the one that you live in right now, then I would like to see it pointed out. The vast preponderance of what we do, the vast preponderance of when we have done it and things like that is not a matter of colonization and it's not a matter of, well, we're just trying to get that resources. It is a matter of it is the right thing to do at that time. And as you look across the aid that we have done, you will find that frequently we have provided aid to people who are not particularly warm in their feeling towards us. But that's okay too because it's the right thing to do at that time. But I will tell you too, ladies and gentlemen, that there are things that we could face, you and I could face today, that would stretch the resources of everything that we have and would not be enough. We came close to that way back in, in, during Hurricane Katrina, the storm of the century, you will remember, until the next storm of the century came up and things like that. And at that time, we had people, our friends, our allies, who wanted to come to our support. And ladies and gentlemen, we were not prepared to receive their support. We were the United States. We were always willing to help them. But I will tell you, and there's things that we can discuss today if you want. There are things out there today that could, as I suggested a moment ago, could stretch the entire capability and capacity of these United States and it would not be enough. So we better start thinking in that direction. If help is available, we better be able to put it in. But even beyond all of that, once again, back to us old timers, we remember organizations like faith-based organizations, communities, things out, out there to do this sort of thing. You know? We have probably evolved too far in, 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 in certain areas of the country. No, by the way, let me pause here for just a second. The thing about being a Fed, and I was a Fed, for, for some, I didn't realize it. I never tried to put it upon my children that they should realize it. But no, I'm, I was kind of a fed. You know, I, was, I was an active duty military person. And we had this mindset of these United States and therefore this state and this state and this state, all the same, right? I've come to tell my students at the beginning of, of every course that, hey, if you've seen one state, you have seen one state. And God bless us, we will almost deliberately go in a direction counter to one another because we can and we're American. And that's fine too. That's fine too. But the simple fact of the matter is the, the type of, 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 of response that we needed for emergencies in the past was almost always a matter of community. Right? That's where things began. The concept was that if the community couldn't handle it, then you reached out to adjoining communities. And if the adjoining communities couldn't handle it, then you reached out to the state. If the state couldn't handle it, then you reached out to the adjoining states. And if they couldn't handle it, then you reach out to the federal government. Right. But people forget that Katrina was the second time in the 20th century where New Orleans was nearly wiped off the map. And the first time, yeah, the country, the government did basically nothing. The last time we had a genuinely what I will refer to as a catastrophic incident, we'll talk about that, that definition later on. Last time we had something like that, I would suggest you all was in the Great Dust Bowl crisis. Anybody here from the mid, Midwest? 770,000 people displaced from their homes and the government did Nothing. Now since that time, of course, we've gotten much better. But we may have gone so far in the other direction that we expect the government to do everything and to be the first response as opposed to the additional capability, the additional capacity. Something for us to think about. But the communities are only, only as strong as the individuals and the families, right? So here's your enterprise. And this leads us to the next thing to what I refer to as the block of resilience that builds upon the notion that the nation is there, but the nation is contingent upon the, pardon me, the community, and the community is contingent upon the families, and the families are contingent upon the individuals, and this square can fall in upon itself if we don't think of our own responsibilities to our society. 
I would suggest to you, yes, you are your brother's keeper. Yes, it is responsible for us to, to all prepare. And it is the responsibility of the government to do those things which we cannot do for ourselves. But let's delineate where those lines are. Okay. All right. So, so much for philosophy. I always do this to citizens whenever I get a chance. Now let's get down to some definitions, if you will. Fundamental definitions. So for homeland security, homeland defense, and defense board of civil authority. What do it mean? Well, the first definition that we had officially with homeland security was the one you see here. You know, basically, it's a concerted national effort to do what? To prevent terrorism, to reduce our vulnerability to terrorism, to, to minimize the damage and mitigate the, the uh, results of a terrorist activity. Terrorism, 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 terrorism. Do I have anybody here from the emergency management community? Okay, great. So you're looking at this and say, okay, what's in it for me? Which is basically a lot of the attitude that went into the Department of Homeland Security. There's some good stuff in here. There's no question about it, but it's all terrorism focused. Why? Because all of this came about due to 9-11, right? That's what we were responding to. That's what we were preparing for. That was what our focus was. Well, things have changed a little bit. Now, the thing I like about this definition, pick it out there, a concerted national effort, not a federal effort, not a governmental effort. A concerted national effort, if you will, a whole of society approach. But we got better over time into where this description came up. And this came out of the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review of, of the, the first iteration of, of that, which is effectively the strategy for the Department of Homeland Security. And they said what this is, what Homeland Security is, is the intersection, I love this, the intersection of evolving threats and hazards with what? Traditional government and civic responsibilities in civil defense and emergency response and law enforcement and border control and customs and, and immigration. But the focus there, I think, is essential in our thinking. Once again, not just governmental. Okay. But those of you are now, you're dangerously close to being smeared with the war college gumbo, right? So pretty soon you're gonna start talking Clausewitzian stuff all the time. You're gonna go, well, that doesn't look like an end ways and means to me, Bert. It looks like it's, it's kind of uh, ways. But what, what's the ends that you're looking for? Well, this is the, the, the latest definition. And it's something that we can bite into, of course. Okay. Once again, a concerted national effort to ensure a society that is safe, secure, and resilient against all threats in order to preserve the American aspirations, interest, and the way of life. That's what it's all about. That's what we're focused on. But there's some nuances here as, as we go forward. The other definition I like here is, is homeland defense. And this is, of course, what you would expect because the defense of the homeland is the responsibility primarily of your military, right? So here we go. We've got a snort scratch sort of definition here. What do we got? We're going to protect. We're going to protect what? We're going to protect the sovereignty, the territory, the domestic population, the critical infrastructure against what? Against external threats and aggression. And anything else that the president might direct. Okay, sounds good. However, comma, pause. External threats. You know, back in the good old days, and some of us remember this, the big threat that we were looking at, we could stare across the table at them at all time. And they stared across the table back at us, and that was it. And there were some proxies out there from both sides, let's be honest. But we knew who the enemy was. But when the wall came down and the Russians became our friends, I read that somewhere, and the Chinese just wanted to make their way into, into the world economy and all was kumbaya, well, the wall came down and then suddenly we had a, another type of aggressor, the terrorist aggressor. Okay. And when the terrorists came into the United States, no question about it, was that an external threat? Well, yes, it was. But then over time, we had other things developing, right? These, these self-seeking, these self-selecting adherence to the terrorist ideology. Is that an external threat or an internal threat? I don't know. And that becomes kind of important. I've got a lady here from the FBI who is wrestling all the time with the nuances about what we can and cannot do based upon these types of definitions. So, okay, that's complicated. Let's go forward. Now here's the other, here's the final definition I wanted to share with you all. This, this used to be known as civil support, now known as defense support of civil authorities. And we're talking about here is when the military can come, can come 
to support the civil authorities in times of crises. Okay, but look at the right at the beginning of that definition. Assistance provided in response to requests from civil authorities. And that's important, folks, because until the request comes in, the, the, the assistance does not come out. Right? And that sounds like, it, like, oh, what are we trying to hold back? No, no, no. What we, well, yes, we are trying to hold, up, hold back a little bit because when we say we are in support of the civil authorities, it's exactly that. We are in support. We are not in charge. And that's hard for some people to pick up on because when the six-foot, two-inch tall General comes to town wearing six stars, as you count them, one, two, three on the left, one, two, three on the right, that's six, wow, he must be in charge, or she must be in charge, and the answer is, don't want to be in charge, okay? We want to be in support, and we want to be in support of what? Well, we want to be in support of special events, activities that they need the additional, additional capacity for, and that's a distinction I'll make along the way here. We want to be able to help out in times of domestic crises, domestic emergencies, both natural and man-made. Right? We want to be able to help out in carefully designated, constrained, contained, don't go too far over the uh, boundaries here with regard to law enforcement and other stuff as may be directed. But the definitions are important and the distinction is important. Now when you put all this on a Venn diagram, and I'm almost, re almost required to do that in, in the Army War College, when you put all this on a Venn diagram, you have Homeland Security, Homeland Defense, and Defense Board of Civil Authority. And you see the definitions of these things basically laid out there, that wonderful definition about the intersection of government responsibilities and, and the requirements thereof. And when we, talk about, when we talk about Homeland Defense, we're talking, all right, we want to begin by being aware of what the potential threats are, and then we want to intercept and defeat those threats. No, ideally, we would like to deter the threats so before they ever get to us, right? And then we want to provide for that other thing that we talk about, that mission assurance, to be sure that we can continue in the mission through whatever the requirements are. We call it continuity of operations. Occasionally, we call it continuity of government, depending on the mission sets that we're talking about. And then, of course, when we talk about defense support of civil authorities, basically, we're talking about what DOD does in, in support of consequence management during a disaster relief operations, or what DOD does in the very carefully constrained canalized areas of law enforcement support. Okay? But you don't have a Venn diagram if you don't have overlaps, right? So let me go ahead and with a little bit of that. One, one of these things, for instance, is back in the good old days, and some of us remember this, back in the good old days when someone was uh, hijacked, and what did it mean? Robert, you remember? It means we're, you're on your way to Cuba. Okay, that's it. You're annoyed. You are really, really inconvenienced, but that's about it, right? We remember that. 9-11, of course, changed the calculus of that. And as you may or may not know, ever since 9-11, we have woken every morning in the United States of America prepared to take down the next airliner before they fly, they fly into the next um, skyscraper. Okay. So that's a little bit of a distinction there and here. CBR and ECO, I, I love acronyms, and I know you two do as well. Chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, and E, by the way, stands for high explosive yield. I don't know who made that up. It certainly wasn't a Marine. But anyhow, when you have that sort of thing, you, you all, those of you from, from local government know you have hazmat capability, hazardous materials. You know what to do with that kind of stuff. But it's not a question of capability, and here's a real let's stop it for you. It's not a question of capability frequently, it's a question of capacity. I have what I need, I just don't have enough. And that's where the military can really, really find itself employed in these sectors. Now for the most part, happily for us, most of the action that you've seen from the Department of Defense within the territorial confines of the United States has been in support of civil authorities. Okay? If the President of the United States should ever cry havoc, let loose the dogs of war, we're in a homeland defense mission, then DOD would be in charge. But then there is another function from the, very, from the very beginning of our development of strategies around these issues, the one where we say this is where DOD is going to enable our partners, either in the federal interagency or our work with federal, state, and local, tribal, territorial governance, or even with our, many of our partners overseas. What we want to do is to be able 
to build their capabilities and their capacities. All the ladies in the room know, if you give a man a fish, he's gotten a meal. If you teach a man a fish, you've got him out of the house for the entire weekend. Okay, so, but this is the sort of thing that, that we ought to be, be thinking about here. And it's part of our, all of the calculus, which has provided for a greater breadth and depth to the capabilities that we have uh, in, in our mindset. Now, when I began working these issues, and in, in actually, I, I was very fortunate. I started looking into the issues before ca catastrophe struck in 2000. We were beginning to talk even then about what we would refer to over time as the Homeland Security Continuum. And at the time, we said that's prevention, protection, response, and recovery. Okay. Now, over time, especially in the Obama administration, they, they, they placed in another element there, the idea of mitigation. Some things that we do uh, with regard to our processes, with regard to our infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which, which prepares that, which makes the systems or the infrastructure more resilient ahead of time, right? And as we looked at these things over time, uh, we really, really, really focused on what we like to refer to as right of boom. Something has happened. Remember, when we talk about these things, we, we say they may be man-made or it may be natural, right? Natural disasters or man-made disasters. Okay. But something has happened. And response and recovery, that's what we've gotten much, much better at. And I will tell you unabashedly that the preponderance of the military response in a situation like this does not come from the Department of Defense. It comes from your National Guards. Okay. That's where the, the problem begins, and that's where the problem most frequently ends. And, and you should be proud of them for it. But when it starts to exceed even those capabilities, even that capacity, then that's when you call in, that's when you call in the feds up to and, include, up to and including the green clad monsters that we have all grown to know and love, right? It's all there. <laughs> so we've become, we were really, really good at response and recovery, but left of boom, <laughs> my slides got messed up there, I apologize. But left of boom, ladies and gentlemen, um, we're not very good, okay? Because preparedness requires expenditures. And in, in the likelihood versus consequence matrix of, of our, our thought process on this, this requires state, local, tribal, territorial, federal government, and the private sector to say, I am going to make an investment in this direction. Because the consequences could be god awful catastrophic. Genuinely catastrophic, and once again, I'll talk about that, that definition here in a second. That's a tough sell. That's a tough sell, folks. Because you're, you're saying, federal government, you're, you want to lead this thing, but you're talking about something that might not happen, right? Yeah, but if it happens, it's going to be really bad. Yeah, but it might not happen. Okay. So there's a balance there that we're also working towards. In the, in the study uh, that a lot of us have, have been working on very uh, fervently, uh, we, we, are, we are starting to make recommendations towards understanding what partnership really means, up to and including the idea of deregulation, maybe tax incentives, things like that. Doing something for the people that you're trying to drag into this partnership for the preservation of the nation. So that's kind of important in, in our thinking. And that, the, the other portions of these things, I, I, once again, either I'm not very good at slide making or there's something else here. This is something that we wanted to fold into the thinking of society writ large and especially the rest of the, the federal interagency. Folks, your, 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 uh, your military is really, really good at planning. Okay? Nobody plans like us. Uh, nobody goes to the, oh my God, detail, stick the pen in your own eye type of planning that we do because we recognize that the cost of that kind of planning or the cost of not doing that kind of planning is usually measured in lives. Okay. But I'll tell you something else. You're, you're, the students that you're among here, and I tell everyone who's, who's had to suffer through with me will tell you that I've told them, they are blessed to be in the United States military because we have looked at them, looked at their potential, and said, you know what, you're going places, and we want to prepare you for that. We educate our people to the next level of responsibility. We don't wait until they're there and say, okay, now we're going to tell you what to do, teach you how to do it. 
That's why they're here at the Army War College. That's why they were at the Command and Staff uh, uh, Colleges, Command and General Staff College for the Army. That's why when they first came in, as they were showing, every time they showed some potential, we were preparing them for the next level of responsibility. We need to do more of that, ladies and gentlemen, if we want our, if we want our government officials to be the best that they can be. If we want them to be what we might need them to be sometime, we need to do that. And that includes planning. So, so the idea here, awareness, I say awareness because I don't dare, dare say intelligence. If you say intelligence and you're in the United States, you're asking for trouble. So we're not doing that. We're, we're talking information. We will talk awareness. We will talk being alert. And, and there's very good reasons for doing that, too. I'll pardon my attempts at humor from time to time. And then the other side of this thing is analysis, okay? One of the other things that your, your, your military does really, really well is we will plan and plan and plan and plan. And then as soon as we got the plan done, by the way, a, a typical operational plan in any of your combat commands takes some, upwards of 18 to 24 months to put together, right? And as soon as you've got the plan put together, you know the next thing you do? You review the plan. No, no, not start over. No, we, we wait. We wait. And after you review the plan, you exercise the plan. And you find the gaps in the plan, and you just keep this thing going, a constant cycle of analysis. The other thing that your military does, and not too many other functions in your, in your uh, society does, is we will exercise to failure. We want to know when this son of a pup is going to break. Because if we do that, then when we get to the actual application, God forbid, then maybe it won't break there. We need to be investing that sort of thinking, folks, in a lot of other areas of our society. Okay. When we talk about security, when we talk about your security, there are, there are two sets of heroes. In, in my mind, and there, there are many more sets here, but there are two sets of heroes. There's, there's the defense and there's law enforcement, right? And as you look across this, this, this chart that I've got up here, uh, the, 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 those are, are distinct. And it, there's some fun stuff about the, the slide that you see before you. I mean, not, not the least of which is, is, you know, defense pretty much goes all to the Department of Defense, but nowadays law enforcement is pretty much well divided between the Department of Justice and Department of Homeland Security. And here's the fun fact, there's more law enforcement and Homeland Security than there. I'm just doing this for my FBI agent, right? Okay, then there, there is the Department of Justice, but that's not, that's not the point. The point here is that, that you've got these things and you've got this distinction. And the ultimate manifestation of the defense, of course, requirement is war. And the routine, if you will, manifestation of the law enforcement requirement is crime. Right? But in between those things, we have identified over time what we refer to as the seam of ambiguity, where we have certain things, certain functions going on here, which are not clearly delineated as either law enforcement or military, right? Maritime security is one of those, by the way. Do I have anybody here from the Coast Guard or, or, okay, or the United States Navy, background like that? The Coast Guard and the Navy are, have become extraordinary partners because they've sat down and the Navy says, you know, we can't do law enforcement. We, we, we can't do that, normally speaking. The Coast Guard says, hey, baby, we're all over. We got it for you, no sweat. But we still got to determine when the threat is coming towards our country, is that a law enforcement issue or is it a defense issue? And it's not automatic. So over time, they've developed this partnership that is manifested through a thing called the Maritime Operational Threat Response, where the Navy and the Coast Guard literally come together and say, okay, your issue, you got it. Now, occasionally our adversaries, including criminal adversaries, they will try to take advantage of what they know to be our psyche the American way of, of life that says, okay, if, if we stay on this side of the line, they can't touch us. So they, they will, for instance, you'll have, you'll have drug cartels almost floating right by uh, United States aircraft carriers. And going, <laughs> but nowadays, too, occasionally you have the aircraft, aircraft carrier that is almost like hoisting the Jolly Roger, and they go, ha, 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 and they raise the Coast Guard emblem, and they've got a law enforcement detachment from the Coast Guard aboard, and we've got you now. That's, that's the sort of thing we're talking about here, that, that, that distinction. Border control, there's another thing. Is that a law enforcement issue? Or is it a 
defense issue. At what point does it become a security issue beyond law enforcement? And the answer is, I'm not exactly sure. So we've got to deal with these things all the time. Here's another area for you. Ready? Cybersecurity. Is that defense? Or is that law? Or is it somewhere in between? Listen, the responsibilities for cybersecurity in the United States is divided between the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Defense. So you know we've got this baby tight. That was a joke, folks. We're working through, we're working through some of these issues right now. Okay? But this is some of the distinctions that we have to work with, that we have to be concerned about because of who we are as a people. Here's another area for you, question of balance. And I've got a state, uh, I've got a state representative here, and some of you have also served in, in those um, environs. And one of the challenges that we have from time to time, at, at the 30,000 foot level, if you will, one of the challenges from time to time is if we have a threat against the people of the United States. The President of the United States can at any given time jump up on, uh, up on his or her desk pound their chest and say, Article 2 of the United States, of the Constitution of the United States says, says that I have the authority and the responsibility to care for the security of this population. At which time, 54 other sovereigns out there who do not reside at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, they call themselves the governors of the states and territories of the United States, they jump on their collective desk and say, I'll see your Article 2 and raise you a 10th Amendment, Bubba, or Babette. I'm getting ready for it, okay? And basically what that means is if the authority is not specifically designated to you in this Constitution, then it remains with the people and that be us. Questions? And they're both right. But as a function of that, we have to kind of, from time to time, tiptoe around the issues. Not, not, ar not around the issues, but in conscious approach to the issues. Because, oh, by the way, this is the Constitution. And it can be occasionally really, really inconvenient. But suck it up, folks, especially for those of you still wearing the uniform. Every time you raise your hand, that's why you begin. I, I swear to support the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So, fun stuff. However, having said all that, once the, the governors have had their moment of, uh, of gravitas, we still have to frame the issue in reality. Now, by any chance, do I have anybody here from the great state of Washington? I'm really sorry, because they're, the adjutant general of the state of Washington for 12 years was a wonderful, wonderful guy we lost a few years ago, named Tim Lowenberg. Major General Tim Lowenberg, who was an Air Force officer, but still a really good guy. And uh, <laughs> stop, come on. Um, and Tim was the authority, if you will, for Homeland Security issues. Among the adjutant generals of the United States, when it was like E.F. Hutton, when Tim spoke, everybody else sat down and listened. He was really, really good at it. He was a, a foundational member of, of, of the, the psyche that we've taken forward here. And Tim had this thing, which I came to call Lohenberg's Division of Disaster. Now, folks, this is not literal. And after a while, he was calling me everything but literate because the, the, the numbers I'm using, I was an English lit major, for crying out loud, give me a break. The, any figures that I use are absolutely figurative. Right? But this is the way that Tim described it, and, and I took it down there, and people, after hearing me sometimes, they said, where do you get these figures, Tim? And I said, not, not really, but here it is. Okay. 94% of all emergencies that happen within the territorial confines of the United States are taken care of in local communities. That's why we have police departments. That's why we have fire departments. That's why you have emergency medical technicians. It's there, right? If they can't handle it, what do they do? Like I described a while ago, they reach out to the adjoining community or to the state, right? So maybe 4% of the time, the emergencies or the disasters will require state to introduce, if not additional capabilities, then additional capacity, right? Okay, real quick here, Mass for Marines, 94. Four. That leaves like 2% of the time, maybe you really need the feds to come in, right? In day-to-day -day operation. Here's the problem, though. When the 2% of the time comes, they want it yesterday. And remember what I said about dual, about uh, defense support of civil authorities? Okay. 
You can't come until you're asked. They don't want you to come until you're asked. Right? So this is, this is part of the balance that we always have to maintain. Right? On top of this is what I refer to as Cummins Law, pardon me, Transitive Law of Disaster. Chip Cummins, who was great, great, another Air Force guy, who would have thought? Uh, at one time a fine uh, pilot, now uh, is a, is a, a bottom-of-dwelling scum-sucking contractor, but that's not the point here either. But Chip had, had this, this what, he, what I refer to as his transitive law. And it goes like this, and everybody knows the transitive law, right? Eng even English lit majors. If A equals B and B equals C, then all together chorus. Man, a whole bunch of English lit majors out there. Okay, okay. So A equals C. All right, so here, here you go. All disasters are local. We talked about that. That's where they begin. Okay? It might be larger than that after a while, but that's where it begins. Here you go. And then, as the late, great Tip O'Neill, former Speaker of the House of Representatives, said famously, all politics are local. Therefore, of course, all disasters are political. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. There is a political element here that has to be. Now, by the way, politics isn't always bad. Little P's, big P's, distinction there, right? Politics is not always bad. Yes, sir? It is. Disastrous. That's exactly right. That's exactly right, sir. Dang, got it. Well, I kind of take that one out of my speech. All right. So, but, but there you go. That's what we're thinking about. Okay. And this is also part of the way that we have to think about as we go forward in the defense of the United States. Now, here's the other thing. And, and in, in support of the United States. The security of the United States. DOD has a philosophy that has developed over time. It's, it's laid out in all of our directives and things, but I'm, I'm giving it a cut down version for you here on how we approach these things. Because remember, DOD, the day job, as much as we would like to be there like 10 men at all times, the DOD, the day job is to fight and win the nation's wars or to prepare and make sure that that's what we can be able to do. Okay? We got a lot of wonderful stuff. We got wonderful people. But if someone says, what's your job? It's, well, basically, ma'am, I'm here, I'm here to break things and kill people. Not exactly that rough, that, that rough but you know, that's kind of it, right? So we've developed a philosophy over time. The first part of that philosophy is this. DOD is in support of civil authorities. DOD is in support of civil authorities. And as I told you before, that's not intuitive to a lot of people. But that's the way it is. The thing that we would like most in life is to be able to arrive on site and say, okay, why don't we do this according to your plan? Or even better than that is, why don't we do this according to the plan that we put together? That's what we would, we would like. It's not always there. Here's the next thing. Civil resources and capabilities should be used first. Now, that sounds like we're being selfish about things, right? But the simple fact of the matter is this. DOD does not, does not, does not budget for disaster response. Okay? It's not there. So everything comes basically out of hide, right? Now, and, and we're the first to recognize when you've got hundreds of billions of dollars of budget, then quit your whining. But then that, there's a focus that you all really expect of the Department of Defense that kind of goes beyond this sort of thing. So that's part of the equation as well. Here's the other thing. One of my, one of my personal heroes as, as I grew up was, was Colin Powell. And this was reflective of the, the Powell Doctrine. Okay. Okay. Missions are going to be limited in, in duration and scope. Actually, the Powell Doctrine is never go in un unless you know how you're getting out. Okay. Never commit unless you've got the, the exit criteria in mind. What's your exit strategy? Right. Once we get there, people really like us, and they really want to hang on to you for a long time. But oh, by the way, there's a crazy... There's a, there's a crazy man across the ocean right now that may be demanding our focus. So something else for us to think about. Response is a total force effort. Now, this is somewhat uh, foreign to, to most of the uh, audience here, and, and, and I understand. But when, when you talk about the Army in particular, okay, you've got three components of the Army. Right? You've got the Army, you've got the Army Reserve, and you've got the National Guard. And they're all Army. They're the total force. Right? But most people... I mean, frankly, candidly, without meaning to be offensive, they can't tell the difference between a, a Nebraska National Guardsman and, 82nd Air, and a, a member of the 82nd Airborne Division. 
they could tell the difference between them and a marine. But I mean, <laughs> so. But anyhow, the point, the larger point is 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 this, that we have got to plan for the utilization of all three of those components, okay? and you've got to plan for the the graded uh, utilization of those components. And once again, more often than not, the discussion is going to stop with the application of the guard. More often than not. But there's some other interesting things about that that we can talk about during questions if you would like. Here's the other thing that gets to a lot of people. Support, we're kind of expecting to be reimbursed. You know? And there are certain uh, laws out there. The Economy Act, which basically says any other agency of the federal government that requests uh, support from another agency of the federal government has to pay that agency of the federal government. Ta -da. More important in the discussion here is the Stafford Act, which is basically what allows us to uh, once, once the, the governor of a given state turns to the president of the United States and, and says, no mas, uh, then at that point we open up the spigot. And that provides for the utilization of resources that we're using to respond to emergencies, emergency response. So that's the sort of thing that kind of also guides the way the Department of Defense deals with this. And then there's this. This is what I refer to loosely as the mission, assure, uh, mission acceptance criteria for the Department of Defense. The first question is, is it legal for us to do this? Okay. And that sounds silly to a lot of people. What do you mean? Illegal? Well, yeah, it, it really can be. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. But legality is the first issue. Here's the next issue, lethality. Okay. What type of capabilities are we taking within the territorial confines of the United States among our own citizenry? And what could that mean? And then following right along with that is the, the question of risk to our own people, to DOD personnel. Okay. What's going on? What's the nature of, of the uh, emergency, the, the disaster, the major disaster? God forbid the, forbid the catastrophic incident. I'm sorry. Cost? Yeah, that, that's kind of important too, the impact on the DOD budget. Remember folks, and, and, and I don't want to give you the impression for a second that, that everybody who would normally wear a un, uniform in this, in this room isn't leaning forward and wanting to do whatever needs to be done in a time of crisis. But nobody else is going to pick up a gun and go overseas, right? That's something we, we've got to kind of keep in mind as we go about all this stuff. And then the impact on readiness, okay? Just we, this responsibility, the penultimate responsibility to you to be able to do what only we do when the crisis comes. And then finally, the thing here is just a question of appropriateness. Is it appropriate for the department? Is it appropriate for the federal government? Is it appropriate for the nation for us to be doing these sort of things? What sort of stuff are we playing out here? What are we setting into the mindset of the American people that says this is the way that we respond as a society? Kind of important for us to play it out. Okay, defense support of civil authorities, basically there are three categories and there are four types of those and the, the categories are what you can see. I, I don't know how well you can read that right here, but the categories are basically domestic emergencies, designated law enforcement activity, and then what we, what we clinically refer to as other stuff. When you talk about types of things, well, the, the, the first, once again, is declared emergencies and disasters. And then the other one, you step over in there, and it says support to restore public health or civil order. And then we go over a little bit more to national special security events. And then finally, to the area of other types of activities. And these are the types of the examples of activities uh, that we will do. But I will tell you folks, as I tried to do dramatically in my presentation, that category right there, when we talk about restoration of civil order, man, you, you have a room full of generals and you can hear the teeth sucking sound from the back of the room. Don't know about that. Okay? So you might be wondering why? What's the distinction? Why, what, what's the big deal here? Well, those of you who have a little bit of knowledge knows about, know about the Posse Combatatus Act of 1878, basically during Reconstruction, where we came upon the, the fundamental restoration of the American mindset that says the military does not do law enforcement. Okay? With my Brit friends, I tell them all the time, you son of a gun, you did this to us. 
back in the quartering acts for crying out loud. And we've had thousands upon thousands of people that came to these shores with the same mindset that says the military is supposed to be our servant, right? Okay. So that's kind of difference. And if you know anything about Posse Comitatus, you know that well, it's really only talking about federal forces, the active component of the army. So if you push the button, right, this is how I normally keep, lower button, lower button, there you go. That's how I usually keep my students in. Good. Okay. Okay. Posse Comitatus only really applies to federal forces, right? The National Guard, not so much, as long as they remain under the control of their governor, they can do law enforcement. They can, all right? But I'll tell you what, I have yet to meet the adjutant general of any given state that says, yeah, baby, give me some of that. I want in. Mm -hmm. You want to know why? Because they have soldiers. They don't have policemen. And that's the distinction we as Americans likes. We, we, we as Americans like, okay? We want our soldiers to be soldiers. We want our policemen to be policemen. We want our military to be our servant, not our overseer. 500 years ago when I was doing something other than talking, when I was actually in the Marine Corps, if I had a, if I had a troop that was hesitating upon sending rounds down range, I'd rip his lips off, or worse to that effect. Because while he's trying to make the correct decision, the person down range has already decided what they're doing, and they're firing rounds, and, and they're either going to take your dumb butt out, or the people next to you who are depending upon their existence. That's the way it is. Sucks, you betcha. But that's the way it is. That's not the way it is in law enforcement. God bless the young men and women in blue that every time they start to reach for their holster, they're going through a series of decisions about what the, the person they're looking at, what's their intention, what's going to happen next, what should I be doing. Da, 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 da. They are trained for that. Bless them for it. But we don't want to cross those streams, do we? Okay, so something for us to think about. There is a posse comitatus ethos, nevertheless, that remains with us, and I want to describe that to you. When we talk about law enforcement, and help me if I'm wrong here, but we, we're talking basically about regulatory, proscriptive, or compulsory activities. Okay, regulatory basically being we're going to control, uh, prescriptive being we're going to prohibit Compulsory meaning even we're even going to coerce for the good of society to constrain the threat against society. Okay? When it comes to the military, yeah, that doesn't apply. We don't do that. So what does that mean, breaking it down piece by piece? Well, it means we do not interdict. We do not arrest. We do not stop and frisk. We do not search and seize. We do not interrogate. We do not collect evidence. We do not surveil. U.S. persons, that goes, notice please, that goes even beyond U.S. citizens, U.S. persons. People who are here legitimately may have more rights in these territorial confines than they ever dreamed of back in their home, depending upon wherever that might be. But that's who we are. And that's the way we do things in our military. Now there are things which should lead us to a examination of, of that, that clearly defined distinction. And what I have here is what I refer to as a variable approach to a variable threat. And what I want you to think in your mind's eye is that little arrow that I have there, that axis of threats against our people with regard to terrorism, especially along our border, okay, and domestic security issues. Let's, let's, let's strike that terrorism piece, just domestic security issues writ large, right? So at the, at the lower end of this thing, basically what we're talking about is border control. Because the vast majority of people who are coming to the United States, ladies and gentlemen, are not different from those that you and I can trace back two or three generations in our own lives. Right? They come here for opportunity. They come here for a greater life for their families. That's why they want here. There's only so much that a country can contain, and we understand that, but understand that they do not have a malevolent motivation behind coming to the East United States. So basically what we're talking about here is controlling the legal entry of people and goods. And for the most part, therefore, by far and away, Customs and Border Protection can take care of it. But as you move up that threat axis for you, there's another area of, of concern here, which I refer to as border safety. 
And that's getting down into not people who are coming to the United States for, for reasons of opportunity. They're coming here to the United States for malevolent intent in terms of crime. Okay? They are not here to, to take down the government of the United States, the people of the United States. That's like killing the golden goose, right? But they are a threat to our people. And frequently, if, if I know I have, I have at least one gentleman from Texas here and, and some of the other border states, you know that frequently our, our officials in localities may find themselves outmanned and outgunned, and therefore we have to be thinking in terms of providing for federal, state, local, tri uh, tribal, even territorial law enforcement to fight back this element. But then as you move up, then you have another area of concern, okay? Which I originally, when I was talking about this, I, I talk about border, border security and defense against terrorism, but I want us to start thinking beyond that. Right? A chairman ago, a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff ago, when he was sitting before the House Armed Services Committee and they said, General, what is the greatest threat to the United States? He did not say Al-Qaeda, he did not say ISIS, he said Russia. And a lot of people went, what can he be thinking? Well, apparently he was prescient at that time. It's showing itself more and more. And you can start to have an intersection of evil here, folks. You can have transnational organized crime and transnational terrorists working together. You can have transnational organized crime, transnational terrorists, and adversary nations who mean us no goodwill, who are utilizing those as proxies towards those ends. When you have something like that, folks, is it too far out of your imagination to, to, to envision a time where we may need to be thinking about the defense of our borders? Just something for us to deal with here for a little bit. Okay. Now I want to get into those definitions I've been promising you all along the way. I know you're so excited. When we talk, the vast preponderance of what we have seen in our times, oh, by the way, let's pause here for just a second. If you run to someone who has been victimized by a hurricane, and everything that they've ever owned in their lifetimes they have lost, and perhaps a loved one they have lost, do not tell them that it wasn't a catastrophe because that tends to annoy people or put them off. But what I'm talking about right now is, is the governmental definitions. And the definitions are important because they all simulate things that will or will not occur. For the most part, things that we have witnessed in these United States, okay, Katrina, Sandy, Harvey, Irma, Maria, wildfires, horrible, horrible things, but those are what we refer to as disasters, major disasters. And as you all saw, it, they, they, they were disastrous, no question about it, but we were able to take care of it. Okay? And not necessarily particularly efficiently, but effectively. Right? We did that over time. What I want to do is, raise, is to raise your minds to the next tier of destruction beyond disaster. I want you to start thinking about a catastrophic incident. Our definition of catastrophic incident is, is an, once again, an occurrence either natural or man-made. And the definition we used at that time so was to include terrorist attack, which resorts in extraordinary, results in extraordinary levels of mass casualties, damage, destruction, disruption, severely affecting our population, our infrastructure, our environment, our national morale, our governmental functions. A catastrophic incident could result in significant national impact over a prolonged period of time. Words are important. Most of the things that we have witnessed have been relatively contained, okay? regionalized even, maybe even within one state. Right? But national significance over a prolonged period of time almost immediately overwhelms the resources that we normally associate with state, local, tribal, territorial, and even private sector authorities and can so significantly impact the governmental operations and emergency operations to such an extent that national security could be threatened. Okay. Now DOD, not to be outdone, came up with their own definition to add to this one, but it's important in what it added. And if we have any time at the end, I'll tell you why the definition came about. But basically, it's, it says, you know what, this is, this is indeed, once again, a natural or man-made event to include, notice please, to include terrorism, but also cyber attack, also power grid failure, leading to what? Leading to a cascading failure of multiple 
interdependent, critical, life-sustaining infrastructure sectors. Folks, I know that sounds like government tease, but when you start to identify what that's talking about, it becomes very, very sobering. Okay. There are 16 critical infrastructure sectors that we recognize that the Department of Homeland Security deals with. Everything from chemical to transportation to nuclear to energy to water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And cyber, of course, runs through everything. There are certain things, well, many of these things, they're critical interdependent. That means you take this out, you're going to take out the next sector and the sector next to it and the sector next to it, resulting in what? Resulting in extraordinary levels of mass casualties, destruction, disruption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the next tier. And this is stuff, ladies and gentlemen, that can be brought about by either a natural or man-made event. Once again, friends from the Midwest? Okay, anyone else? All right, now friends from the Northwest. Wow, what an isolated group, okay? Anyway, anyone from the Midwest of the United States has been watching uh, a growing concern over the New Madrid Fault, right? Basically goes through the heartland of these United States. Okay. Last time New Madrid went down was in the early 1820s. Okay, geography majors, watch this now. And it rang church bells in Boston. It reversed the flow of the Mississippi River at times when there weren't tiny little pieces of infrastructure like Memphis, Nashville, St. Louis, things like that. Okay. Taksan bad is what my, my Japanese friends would say about it. Okay. Cascadia subduction zone in northwest in northwestern United States would bring about the same sort of effect. So what are we talking about here? Well, let me let me try and 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 display this to you. Quantitative impact. Katrina was bad, no question about it. All right. The Gulf Coast region of three states were devastated. They were in the neighborhood of eighteen thousand people who were. Uh, pardon me. 17,000 reported injuries, 1,800 people lost their lives, 30 hospitals had to be closed. It was bad. New Madrid happily has not gone down, but in, 19, in 2011 we had a, a national level exercise where we looked at what might happen if New Madrid went down. Here's what they, they speculated at that time. Okay? First of all, we're talking about an eight state region spread, spread across four different FEMA regions. Right? And we're talking about type of destruction where immediately you have 83,000 injuries. Immediately you have 3,500 deaths. Now why do I make that distinction? Because the secondary and tertiary effects of what's, what could be happening here could lead to deaths of millions within weeks. Okay. Qualitatively, what are we talking about here? Well, okay, let's look at the upper side of this thing. Katrina was bad, no question about it. But let's talk about critical infrastructure. Let's go right to power. Right. Without power, a whole lot of stuff stops, right, quickly. Okay. As bad as Katrina was, and this is the, the conservative figure here, as bad as Katrina was, within two weeks' time, we had the impacted region powers restored. Okay. Okay. If New Madrid were to go down, they speculate that it would take upwards of 18 months to restore power in a significant sector of eight states in these United States. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't have power, you don't have transportation, you don't have power, you don't have water flowing. You don't have power, your hospital's not operating, your emergency operation centers aren't, and law enforcement is sucking wind. Okay? Why am I bothering you all with this stuff? This is not your business. Well, maybe it might be some of your business. But the point is, we've got to start thinking about this now. And what I've talked about so far, folks, has been simple, relatively speaking, because I'm just talking about the hand of nature. In my mind, and we've been looking at this, some of us have been, have been studying this for two years now at the behest of uh, FEMA. In my mind, the most cataclysmic, the most god-awful catastrophic incident that could hit the United States, what we originally referred to as a national security emergency, would be war. Because folks, the next time we go to war, war is coming to us. Cybernetically, kinetically, whatever. The deterrents are no longer there. The calculus has changed. And we've got to start thinking about this and being prepared for it. 
our traditional approach, our traditional approach, ladies and gentlemen, to, okay, something has happened, now we're going to respond and do well, that won't do well. We're going to find ourselves in a situation where some authority is going to have to go, okay, you're hurting, you're hurting, you're hurting, you're hurting most, and this is where the resources are going to go. Imagine looking down the barrel of those governors and saying, I'm sorry, we don't have enough to take care of this right now. We've got to start thinking about this. Talks like these do not get you invited to too many cocktail parties. But ladies and gentlemen, people like you are the ones that are going to be able to bring this, this about. Talking to your representatives and saying, okay, what, what about this? What are we doing? What are we thinking about? Challenges that lie ahead, therefore, okay? Well, federalism and state sovereignty, that will always be an area of friction, and it's not one that we want to go away. We just have to be prepared for it. We've got to think about it. We signed on for it. That's the Constitution. That's us as a people. Protecting critical infrastructure, I think I probably made that pretty clear by now. Border security, mm. tough stuff. Really, really tough stuff. And not something that can be handled just by the border states, nor should we ask the border states to be handling it. But to what degree, to what end, to what message? Because, you know, at the end of the day, I still want to be, I still want to be that city on the hill that the rest of the world looks at. Preparing for national security emergencies. Preparing for both natural and man-made. And then finally, this idea, and this is something I want you to take home, please. One of the worst problems that we have, I would suggest to you in these United States, is not, is not the problems that we have, but the sense of complacency that we have and the expectation of the government taking care of everything, everywhere, all the time. So when you go back home and, and you get back with your friends and they, they do start complaining about the government. Why isn't the government doing this? Why isn't it like, like, as gently as possible, turn back to them and say, yeah, you know, you're probably right. But what are, what are you doing about it? You are your brother's keeper. The most vulnerable people in our society are the people who live right next door to you. Take care of that. Okay, folks, they're going to call me everything but literate if I keep you guys much longer, but uh, I'm sorry I've taken you over. Do you have any, any questions for me? Here's the last, ooh, 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 here's, here's, ah, meant this one, okay. <laughs> no, no, two, two, two things important about this, right? That's my name, that's my number, that's my email. 